Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent here in Newcastle, Eastern Pennsylvania, <clears throat> in the Erie, Pennsylvania area. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Book 1, Chapter 4. Brethren, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and the dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now it is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. But to me it is a very small thing to be judged by you or by man's day. But neither do I judge my own self, for I am not conscious to myself of anything, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge not before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise from God. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke, chapter 3. Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being the governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother Tetrarch of Ituria, and the country of Traconitis, and Lasanias, Tetrarch of Abilina, under the high priests Annas and Caiaphas. The word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. And he came into all the country about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance for the remission of sins. As it was written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths, every valley, shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. We have one week till Christmas. The Christmas Vigil is a fast and abstinent, is fast and partial abstinence, I think. And then the great Christmas Day uh, in one week from now, December 25th. And your prayers are asked for my brother Tom, who is languishing with cancer. And then uh, Megan Roberts, who was also having cancer with a baby. And uh, the doctors actually had the gal to propose an abortion. And thank God she has the faith. She's a Catholic, traditional Catholic girl, and she refused, of course, and her husband with her. So, so she puts all her trust in God, so let's pray that God's will be done. And we can certainly pray for a miracle that this cancer just die out. And she uh, bears the baby and raises that baby with her other five or six children. Also pray for pa Father Pavone. He's been uh, put to the penalty box by the Pope and his bishop. Um, I don't know all the ins, ins and outs, but it is ugly. It is. He is a pro-life priest. He's not a sordo, but he's very active in the pro-life. And he has done much good. Here's what Bishop Strickland of T the Diocese of Tyler in Texas, this is what he said about this, this parody. Quote, the blasphemy that he's accused of is that this holy priest is canceled while an evil president promotes the denial of truth and the murder of the unborn at every turn. Vatican officials promote immorality and denial of the deposit of faith and priests promote gender confusion, devastating lives, evil, said Bishop Strickland. So this is a bishop that's well on the way to becoming a traditional bishop. So pray for him. And he's disgusted with the way they're treating Father Pavone. You know, Father Martin gets promoted. He has his books published. And he's backed by Pope Francis, who kisses him and hugs him. And they can have each other because they're leading each other to hell. 
And this Pope Francis, he's leading many souls to hell. And he's working hands in hands with the globalists to smash. In the United States now, you can see it. They're coming after the pro-lifers. All those leading the pro-life movement, they're coming after them. So it is a, it's, the, it's the teeth of this ugly beast, the powers of darkness, the synagogue of Satan, the powers in the high places governed by Satan. As St. Paul says, our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities in the dark and high places. So, but even all these globalists and these men who think they're so powerful, they are nothing when it comes to Our Lady. And she will step in. She did promise at, at Quito, Ecuador, when all of, everything seems paralyzed, I will step in and overthrow it because everything will be in the grip of the Freemasons, she said. And even look at the resistance, the state of the Catholic resistance. We're 10 years after the compromise of the SSPX. Right now, there should be a seminary in the US, there should be a seminary in France, there should be one in England, there should be one in Asia. Of course, Father Chazal is, is trying, trying to keep that going. And he was blasted by a, a hurricane. But, uh, you know, the resistance should be structured. It should be a revival, strong, healthy, like the first 10 years after Archbishop Lefebvre founded the society. There was many priests, many seminaries, and the work of Catholic tradition was organized, structured, supernatural, and just continued the work of what Pope Pius X and all the popes commanded. Spread the kingship of Christ, give the true sacraments, offer the sacrifice of the Mass of all time, and fight the modernists head on. And if you remember in the 90s, Father Peter Scott, when he was district superior, he was fighting the bishops of the United States uh, all the time with, with uh, letters head on head against these modernists. And, but look, look what's happened. The, it's the, the, by the bishop that everyone hoped would lead it, he mocks the resistance, he doesn't believe in the resistance, he says uh, resistance, A-N-T-S, put away your toys, and all this talk, you would think, how do I, how do I word this? If a Freemason was in that position, he would be doing exactly the same thing. Smash the resistance, diffuse it, neutralize it, don't let any growth take root. No seminaries, mock structure, mock the organization that Archbishop Lefebvre built, and any saint in the history of the church always has a rule of life. Order, there is order, there is structure, there is organization. If there was a Freemason in that position of a bishop, he would do exactly that. Diffuse it. And I'm not saying Bishop Williamson is a, is a, is a Freemason. I'm not saying that. But all I'm saying is, if there was a Freemason in his position, that's exactly what he would do. <laughs> so, we are paralyzed. And we turn to bishops, please, we need seminaries, we need holy oils, we need the Catholic resistance to be spearheaded by a bishop. He doesn't have to do everything hands-on and, and administrate, but at least do what a bishop is supposed to do. Preach the Catholic faith publicly. That means use the internet. Promote the kingship of Christ. Fight the modernism. Fight what is destroying the Catholic Church and bringing souls to hell, which are Vatican II and the New Mass and the New Code of Canon Law. And instead of trying to throw confusion in the whole works and saying, well, the New Mass gives grace, the New Mass promotes miracles, the New Mass this, the New Mass that, what does that do to souls but confuse them and start questioning, well, maybe the new mass isn't so bad. Maybe I could go to it if there's grace. Maybe these new, new mass miracles are true. And it just causes confusion. So we're paralyzed. We are paralyzed. We need Our Lady to step in. And, you know, where, what bishops are doing their duty today? Show me one that's publicly holding the line of Catholic tradition and of Archbishop Lefebvre. Show me one. 
and I will, uh, I will beg him to, let's, we need a seminary in the United States to get going. This is 10 years behind schedule. And think of all the boys that should be already training, being disciplined, embracing a regimented life in order to prepare to spread the kingship of Christ and fight the fight of Archbishop Lefebvre. And now all the new SSPX priests, they've all been muzzled. They've all been silenced. The proof is, they'll say, well, we still preach against Vatican II. We still preach against the new Mass. Well, much less, much less by far than before. And then they're absolutely silent, including Bishop Follet, on criticizing Pope Francis. He needs to be openly refuted for his public scandal of Pacamama, his public scandals with Father Martin, his public scandals with supporting the globalist agenda. And yet, silence. That's the proof. There's the agreement. It's the agreement without calling it an agreement. It's the compromise without calling it a compromise. And the document that really proves it is the six conditions for the agreement with Rome, which Bishop Follet fully promoted and fully backed and still does. And then also the doctrinal declaration of April 14th, 2012, which happened exactly 100 years after the sinking of the Titanic. And it was the sinking of the, the new SSPX. So we need to pray for them, because I know there's, there's tons of good priests in the Society of St. Pius X, and they're true priests, valid priests. But they have dropped the fight of Archbishop Lefebvre, because I, I was there when the facts came in. You will no longer preach. You won't mention politicians. So nowhere in the SSPX priests you're going to hear them condemning Biden, saying he should be excommunicated, <clears throat> and Pelosi, and Newsom, and Trudeau, and all these so-called Catholics who are scandals. And you're not going to hear that, because they've been muzzled. And people need to hear this, so they vote correctly, and not vote for some pro-abortion criminal. And the way things are going, you can see they're attacking the pro-lifers. And that means... Well, we know what it could turn into. So, but the Catholic resistance, where is it now? We're, we're really paralyzed. It's paralyzing. And many good priests of the so-called resistance, we call them the fake resistance, they're afraid to counter Bishop Williamson in public. They're afraid to say he's wrong on the promoting the new mass miracles, new mass gives grace, new mass nourishes your faith. Why? Because they'll be punished. They won't get holy oils. They'll be kicked to the side and kicked in the teeth. And I've been begging these bishops, please give me a bishop or at least permission to confirm this 13-year-old crippled boy in central New York who's in a wheelchair, can't feed himself, he's in diapers. He can smile, he can laugh, but he's, he's not near death, but he needs confirmation. And I beg these bishops... I don't get any response from Bishop Zendeos and Bishop Williamson. The last time I wrote to him, I said, well, you say I criticize you. You say I, I, dis, I misrepresent your position on the new Mass. So I wrote him back and said, well, please show me where I misrepresent you. I would gladly re repair that in public. And in fact, I hope I'm wrong because I... I would love to be proven wrong on this point. But no response, because he knows that all I did was quote him. All I did was quote him. So the resistance is the Catholic resistance, the work of Archbishop Lefebvre, the fight of Catholic tradition, the SSPX Marian Corps, whatever you want to call it, it's paralyzed because of the bishops. And they're going to answer for this before God. They will answer for this. And here we got some Navasoro bishops who have a little bit of spine to speak up against the needle, as Bishop Strickland did. He said, I will not use murdered babies as medicine. I will not use murdered babies as, as uh, medicine. He said that. While the, the traditional bishops are approving these needles, which are absolutely immoral, because they use 
babies that are murdered while they're alive to get their, their cells. That's a fact. It's not just distortion and stories. It's a fact from doctors and nurses who have witnessed it. Secondly, it's gravely immoral because it's a system of eugenics to kill off much of the population. And that's out of their own mouths. So priests and bishops who approve this or say, well, if you're going to lose your job, you can still get it. They're being foolish, absolutely foolish, and they're misleading the faithful. And they're going to be responsible for the deaths the deaths of many of the parishioners and even themselves for taking this, these demonic shots. So, what is the state of the Catholic resistance now? It's in God's hands. As the, the Catholic Church is in, our, in God's hands. He promised the gates of hell will not prevail. So what we, must we do now? We must pray, one, for a good pope that will consecrate Russia properly. Two, we've got to pray for some good bishops, preferably the bishops of Archbishop Lefebvre, who were supposed to continue the fight of tradition and not cave in and not become silent and not become cowardly and compromising and mock the Catholic resistance and diffuse it and neutralize it into, into just survival of a few priests trying to maintain the faith. So we need to pray for good bishops who will, who will spearhead seminaries. We need Catholic seminaries and monasteries and convents. But when you get a bishop who's supposed to be leading this, he's saying this is not the age for seminaries. That's how a modernist would speak. It's always the age for seminaries because it's always the need for Catholic priests of tradition. So... I'll be, a, I'll be accused of attacking Bishop Williamson, but I, I really am not. I'm, we're all disappointed in what he's doing, and we pray for him and beg him to come back to why he was consecrated. That's all. Do your duty. That's all. And we love you, we venerate you, but not the turn you've took since 2014 when you started promoting the new Mass. So we pray for you, Bishop Williamson. We, we love you as our, one of the champions consecrated by Archbishop Lefebvre. But may this not be your last chapter. That goes for Bishop Follet, that goes for Bishop Tissier, and Bishop, Bishop de Gagalaretta. They have a duty to continue the work of Archbishop Lefebvre. And not his work, really. It's the work of Catholic tradition. So pray for them all. And let's continue to Beg the Mother of God, keep her rosary, wear her scapular, and prepare for a holy Christmas. Let us look at a little bit into Our Lady and St. John the Baptist. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today is December 18th. It is traditionally, on this day, there is a Mass for the expectation of Our Lady, expecting with child. And Our Lady bore the child Jesus you know how many mothers, some very good and generous mothers, get sick. Some of them in the later stages of the pregnancy, they have to lie down. And they feel the weight. They have trouble walking upstairs because this, this little eight, nine pound little baby, they can feel it. And they, they feel the burden of the weight. But with Our Lady, it wasn't anything like that. Our Lord was a feather in her womb. And it was pleasant. Everything about our, the pregnancy, everything about the birth was miraculous, was pleasant, and totally pain-free. Because she was the spotless virgin mother, and this was the spotless living God in her womb. And it was a miraculous birth on Christmas night. Listen to some of the words of the fathers here. When St. Luke says in chapter 2, verse 3, and all went to be enrolled in Bethlehem to declare themselves subject to the Augustus and the Romans and to enlist on their account. So all went to be enrolled, everyone into his own city, to the cities from which their respective families took their origin, as Bethlehem was the chief city of the house of David, of which St. Joseph and Christ were born. So King David, a thousand years before, was born in Bethlehem, and he watched sheep 
he was a shepherd prefiguring Christ who would be born in Bethlehem and also be the shepherd of shepherds the, and David was born and raised in Bethlehem like Saint Joseph Saint Joseph was born in Bethlehem that's why they had the census of Rome and went to, Ro to Bethlehem to be enrolled in the census the Jews had divided their nation and Republic into 12 tribes and these again into different families, each of which had its chief. And so the Romans, in taking the census among them, followed this division. Indeed, all this was taking place under God's direction, that it might be clear to the whole world from this census that Christ, then newly born in Bethlehem, was a descendant of the tribe of Judah and the house of David, and that he was the Messiah, as the prophets had foretold even though Augustus and his governor, Chirinus, did not intend or even know this. So they went to be enrolled, that is, to make a declaration. Both were done here in Bethlehem. Each one was enrolled and made a declaration of allegiance to him who enrolled him, namely to the governor, Chirinus, Chirinus and the vicegerent of Augustus Caesar. For at Rome all were enrolled as citizens and subjects concerning whose loyalty towards Augustus and the Senate there was no doubt. So here they're showing that they're Romans by this allegiance. Elsewhere, though they were said to make a declaration of allegiance as being foreigners subdued by the Roman arms, Orosius in Book 6 in the last chapter infers from this enrollment that Christ was a Roman citizen. This is a very interesting point. Christ became, a, in a way, a Roman citizen. That he might, as it were, tacitly indicate that all Christians must be subjects to the Roman pontiff and the Roman Catholic Church. Christ, he says, would be called a Roman citizen by his profession during the Roman census. So, if Christ becomes a Roman citizen, we also are Roman Catholics. That's the, the implication. Symbolically, by this enrollment in which all profess to be subjects of Augustus and the Romans, <coughs> it is signified that the newborn Christ was come to free us from the servitude of the devil and subdue all the world to himself and to his faith and his worship of the Mass not by force of arms and weapons and armies, but by the efficacy of his grace. And for this reason, Caesar Augustus at that time refused the title of Lord, as the historian Orosius and others testify. Again, St. Gregory in his homily 8 says, Why is it that a census of all the world is taken when the Lord is about to be born, except that it is thereby clearly shown that he was appearing in the flesh who would enroll his elect in eternity. For on the other hand, it is said of the reprobate by the prophet, let them be blotted out of the book of the, book of the living and not be written with the just. So St. Gregory's point is Caesar Augustus is enrolling the whole world as Roman citizens and Christ, the real emperor, not just of Rome, but of, of all the universe, of heaven and earth, Christ, the universal emperor, is enrolling all souls into his Roman Catholic Church for heaven, to be enlisted for heaven. Origen, one of the church fathers, says this, To one who regards the matter attentively, it seems to present a kind of mystery, as though in the enrollment of the whole world, it was fitting for Christ to be enrolled as well, that being enrolled with all other men, he might sanctify all men, and that having entered into the, in the census with all the world, he might grant to the world something in common with himself, thus freeing them from slavery to the devil, who was the prince of this world. So these records were actually taken after Christ was given the name of Jesus, which was on the eighth day 
after his birth, he was circumcised. Some believe it was in the synagogue of Bethlehem. Others believe that it was actually in the cave. They brought the priest, uh, the Old Testament priest, into the cave where the Holy Family was in Bethlehem, and he was circumcised there. As St. Joseph held the baby Jesus, and he shed his first blood. But the records went to Rome. These are actual factual records. And this is what Cornelius Alapide, the priest, says. These records entered onto the public tablets, which Tyrannius forwarded to Caesar Augustus, the emperor in Rome, to wit that Jesus, the son of Mary, was born in Bethlehem of the lineage of David. And St. Saint, Saint Justin speaks about this in his Apologia, Book 2. Also Origen, Theophylactus, and Eutymius mention this. So the census of Jesus' name was recorded in Rome. So think of this. In the year 313, when Rome becomes Catholic under Constantine, and Rome <clears throat> embraces the Catholic faith. They go and look into these records. They go and look into the archives. And the Catholics would have been eager to see this, to know this fact. Jesus, son of Mary, born in Bethlehem, and the exact date. And those records are irrefutable. <coughs> and then verse 4 and 5 of St. Luke chapter 2, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his espoused wife, who was with child. Here was fulfilled the prophecy of Nicaeus, book 5, chapter 5, verse, verse 2, that Christ should be born in Bethlehem. They traveled from Nazareth, a town in Galilee, where at the Annunciation of the Angel, the Blessed Virgin had conceived Christ on March 25th. Now, nine months later, December 25th, she's going to give birth. Hence, Christ was called by the Jews a Galilean and a Nazarene. And Samson of old, the Old Testament Samson, the fighter, the warrior, he was also called a Nazarene, and he prefigured Christ. And then listen to these details. They went to the city called Bethlehem. Bethlehem is 90 miles from Nazareth. It's an 8 to 10 days walk. So this is December, so it's cold, it's rainy at night. It's wet, it's muddy. They're going up and down hills, up and down some steep ridges with St. Joseph, Our Lady, and the donkey. But I repeat again, Our Lady did not suffer any pain with burying the child Jesus. It was a total desert. It was a total bliss, a total delight. And think of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Think of the two hearts. They say that on the tilma of Guadalupe, you can put a stethoscope on it and you will actually hear two hearts beating, one slower and one small and fast. And this, in fact, would have happened. Think of Our Lady bearing the baby Jesus, the two hearts beating. Our Lady, slow, and the baby Jesus being so small, his heart already beating for the love of souls, beating for the love of his Father, who will offer himself as a high priest on the cross, and very soon in the Mass. The baby heart, the little heart of Jesus, pumping. So you have the salvation of the whole world in that basilica, the most beautiful basilica built by God with no stains and no blemish, the Virgin Mary. And in her immaculate heart, the blood from her heart pumps and gives the blood to Jesus Christ that will pump in his sacred heart that will be the redemption of the human race. So Our Lady during that eight to ten days walk would have been always in contemplation with Jesus Christ, her divine Son, and think of her with St. Joseph. Can you picture Our Lady being a nagging wife? You know, St. Joseph, you went, the, you went the wrong way. Joseph, you took a wrong turn. Joseph, you forgot 
to stop and get some bread. We need some olives. Whatever it is. Can you picture her being a nagging wife? I don't think so. But she would have been sweet. If she had to make any suggestions, it would have been in a very humble way, no doubt. You can read the Mary of Agreda's description and also Sister Maria by Sister Cecilia Bailly. She has also in the 1700s, this holy nun had revelations about St. Joseph. And you can read the conversations that Our Lady and St. Joseph had. And they're just full of respect and full of honor and full of uh, down-to-earth uh, respect. St. Bernard, in his sermon on the words of the Apocalypse, a great, a great sign appeared in heaven, chapter 12, says these words, Our Lady went up to Bethlehem, her delivery being near at hand, bearing that most precious trust, bearing a light burden, bearing Him, capital H, bearing Him by whom she was born, meaning car she carried Him, who carried her and all the universe in his power, essence, and presence. She alone conceived without defilement, carried without trouble, and brought forth her son without pain. What about St. John the Baptist? This is a gospel today. St. John the Baptist, he's, he's another outstanding saint that's honored during Advent. In this gospel today we see Saint John the Baptist. He is a voice crying in the wilderness and he stay, he's saying, make way by repentance for the way of Christ. Listen to some of these details brought out by Father Cornelius Alapite. He refers to the great historian Baronius who became a cardinal he wrote a great several works of history, several volumes, and he was the one encouraged by St. Philip Neri to do it. And he writes this, Peter of Alexandria, Nesiphorus, Chedrenus, these are historians, are of the opinion that this retirement and flight of John into the desert took place at five years old. St. John the Baptist went to the cave along the Jordan River. Why? Why at five? Here's the answer. It took place through fear of the infanticide Herod, because Herod was killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem, and some say up to over 4,000 boys were, were killed, slaughtered, and some say even more. But so the mother, St. Elizabeth, Zachary, her husband, was killed by Herod because he, 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 well, we'll come to this. Here's what he says. Whom, whom I discussed in Matthew, for although St. John was not living within the confines of Bethlehem, where the infants were killed, yet on account of the fame of his wonderful nativity, since everyone was saying, what do you think that this child shall be? So remember, St. John the Baptist's birth was, became known to everybody because Zechariah, his father, was offering sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem and he comes out mute. And then nine months later, he writes on the tablet, his name is John, and then he can speak. So everyone is talking about this. What, what kind of child is this going to be who has all these m strange and miraculous events around him? So Herod had his eyes on this child because some people thought he would be the Messiah. And they did. Remember, they come to St. John the Baptist, are you the Christ? And he says, no, I'm not. Are you the, are you the prophet? No, no, no. And he, he always says, no, I'm just the voice crying in the wilderness. So why did St. John the Baptist go at five years old? Because to flee from Herod's attacks. And other sources say that St. John the Baptist was in the vicinity of Bethlehem. There were two Bethlehems. And he, some say he really was, and that's why he fled out to the cave. The fear and anger of Herod extended to St. John the Baptist. For fearing that he was the king of the Jews, 
sought by the Magi, that is, the Messiah, he commanded him to be killed. Therefore, St. John the Baptist, in order to escape Herod's slaughter, was taken away by his mother, St. Elizabeth, into the desert when he was two years old and was hidden there in a cave. The historian Chedrenus adds that John's St. John's mother died after 40 days in the same cave, and that an angel undertook the charge of bringing up St. John the Baptist. So too, Nisiphorus, the historian, says, quote, And then he was accustomed to spending time willingly in solitary places, and following an angelic way of life, he withdrew to the more remote parts of the wilderness. Historian Peter Alexandrinus adds that Herod commanded his father, St. Zachary, to be killed between the temple and the altar because he had removed St. John the Baptist, his son, out of mortal danger. The cause, therefore, of St. John the Baptist's withdrawal into the desert was the fear of Herod, the infanticide, the, the Joe Biden of his day, pushing abortion. But there were besides other and more important causes on the part of God and St. John the Baptist. The first was so that in the desert, St. John the Baptist might avoid the occasions of sinning, which are supplied by associating with men in the cities. Hence the church sings of St. John the Baptist, quote, At a tender age thou didst seek a desert cave, fleeing the city throngs, so as not even to be able to stain thy life with a fickle flame. The second cause was that he might freely reprehend the vices of the Jews without fear of anyone, inasmuch as he, he knew no one, but like the angel coming down from heaven, preached heavenly truths. So St. John Chrysostom says, he never saw any of his fellow servants and was never seen by anyone. And Theophilactus, one of the church fathers says, St. John the Baptist departed that he might be brought up <coughs> beyond the reach of the malice of the multitude and might not be afraid of censoring anyone. So why was he put in the cave around 3, 4, 5? Because God protected him from bad company and enabled him when he came, became public, he could attack sin without any fear of hurting anyone's feelings. The third reason was that as a future preacher of repentance, St. John the Baptist might himself give a pattern of repentance by living severely in the desert, the better to draw his listeners away from the world's allurements as one who has spurned them himself, says St. Bede. For austerity of life gives, gives to a preacher a great weight of authority. The fourth reason he was in the cave, and he would be in the cave living on locusts and honey, from about age 3, 4, 5 to age 25 or 30. And that's when he became public and pointed to the real Christ, the, the Lamb of God. Behold, etche on your day. And he will baptize Christ and will pour water over his head and the, he will see the Father the, and the Holy Ghost and the Son before his eyes. The manifestation of who Christ is and he will hear the voice of the Father. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The fourth reason was that by conversing continually with God and the angels, St. John the Baptist might lead an angelic life according to the words, Behold, I send my angel, and he shall prepare the way before my face. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. For St. John, living apart from the world in the desert, devoted himself to fasting, prayer, and contemplation. St. John Chrysostom says he was always singing hymns, always at prayer having conversed with no man before he came to baptize, but always conversing with God alone. And Origen says he might have time for prayer and might hold con conversation with the angels and call upon God and hear him answering and saying, Behold, here I am. The fifth reason was that St. John the Baptist might be a witness and herald of Christ above all exception. For in the desert he, he could have been taught by no man, but only by God and the angels, which is why he was 
Theodidactus, taught of God. He was taught by God and received from God infused knowledge of sacred scripture and of other things that he preached. So remember, going back to the visitation, when Our Lady had in her womb the newly conceived baby Jesus, and she went with St. Joseph to visit through the mountain regions to visit St. Elizabeth and St. Zachary, her husband. As soon as Our Lady approaches St. Elizabeth, St. John the Baptist is six months in her womb, and he dances for joy. And that light of Christ shining through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus, that light of Christ burns off the original sin of St. John the Baptist. And he, at that moment, was sanctified in St. Elizabeth's womb. That was his baptism by fire. And he received sanctifying grace, and he received the full use of his reason. So he knew what was going on. Hence, Euthemius, another historian, says it was fitting for St. John the Baptist to be trained in virtue from childhood so that he might freely censure and might be a trustworthy witness of Christ whom he should announce. Titus says, so that the one who was to bear witness to Christ and fearlessly to rebuke the iniquity of men, like Herod's adultery, should be held as a witness and a teacher above all reproach. St. John, therefore, in the desert was an inhabitant of heaven, both because he had the heaven for a home and a roof, the skies, and also because by continually contemplating heaven, he in his mind dwelt in heaven and imitated the life of those who dwell in heaven. So St. Gregory Nazianzen praises St. John the Baptist in the desert, saying these words, he held off hunger with wild honey and the humble locust, the offspring of Zachary his father, and clothed his limbs with a camel hair garment, and had as his home the revolving heavens. And upon the hard earth he laid down his body to sleep. So St. John the Baptist must have been just a tough, rugged, but very kind-hearted soul. He must have been a beautiful blend of austerity and gentleness. A true man. A true, true man. Not in soft garments and living a soft life and, and living selfishly and giving to every pleasure like a fat slob, but really disciplined, but also not harsh. Very kind-hearted, very a loving soul. And he loved souls. That's why he, he stuck his neck out to save souls. So much so, he will stand up to Herod and say, you cannot cause scandal by your public adultery. Herod will arrest him and have later have his head chopped off. Christ will praise St. John the Baptist as being the greatest among all women, born of women. In the church year, there are four feasts of St. John the Baptist. His birth, his death, his martyrdom, his other, the two Sundays of Advent, which praise him. St. Gregory Lanzianzius says about St. Basil, retired hence from us to Pontus and ruled over the schools of piety which were in those parts and with Elias and St. John, the greatest philosophers embracing solitude. Elias of Crete, commenting on the first oration of St. Gregory Nazianzen, gives another reason for the solitary life of St. John the Baptist, saying, since Christ and St. John the Baptist were relatives, they were cousins, Therefore, lest St. John might seem to bear witness to Christ because of his relationship to him, it was brought about by the grace of the Holy Ghost that he should lead a solitary life during the whole period of his early years, that he might not seem to give this testimony through friendship or through some kind of, of favor, but that he might announce the very fact as something learned from God. And therefore he said, And I knew him not, but he who sent me to baptize with water said unto me, He upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, he it is that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. St. John chapter 1, verse 33. So John is a figure of those who are sanctified from childhood. 
and by advancing to the end preserve a most firm and constant habit of virtue. For when as yet he was in his mother's womb, he, was recogni he recognized our Lord and leapt with great joy. <coughs> so the greatness of St. John the Baptist shines in this Advent, in these masses of Advent, these Sunday masses, and these great figures, Isaiah the prophet, St. John the Baptist, the last of the great prophets, and then the Virgin Mary, who today on this December 18th, there's a feast of her expecting the birth of the child Jesus. Everything was done in sweetness. Everything was done easy for her. Her suffering will come when she gives birth to us. She will give birth to us at the foot of the cross. St. Bernard says, and one of the other saints says, she didn't give birth to the head in any pain, but she gave birth to the body of the mystical body of Christ, that is all those who will be washing Christ's precious blood through baptism and the sacraments, she will give birth to them in, in terrible suffering and pain at the foot of the cross. And she will hold the body of our Lord at the foot of the cross. And she'll look at what I have done to him, what you have done to him, what the whole human race has done to the body of Christ, mangled, stiff, cold, pierced through his heart, crowned with thorns, his tongue all dried like, like baked clay, because he died in the suffocating position. That's the work of sin. That's how she gave birth to us. That's why she loves us so much. She really loves each soul. Even the, the worst of the worst and the best of the best, she loves them. She doesn't want any soul lost. So that's why in this Advent, let's really turn to her. And in this last week left before Christmas, really repent of our sins, really make good confessions, really turn with our whole heart to God and truly convert to him, to love him with all our mind, all our heart, all our soul, all our body, all our strength. And that through her intercession, God give us a good Pope, good bishops, an army of priests and nuns and and great Catholic families who will be take all the children God sends and repopulate this world. We don't need this eugenics program killing off people to save the environment. That's all a bunch of lies and it comes from the synagogue of Satan and the Masonic lodges. God made this world with plenty of room for billions and billions and billions of people. Just drive through the countryside. There's plenty of room and the environment will not be badly affected. So God is, knows what he's doing. When he gave the orders to Adam and Eve and to all married parents, increase, multiply, and fill the earth. Those are three commands in the imperative, plural. Implete, crescat, crescite, multiplicamini. Fill the earth, increase, and multiply. That's the heart of God. That's the will of God, because he wants heaven full. So let's turn to St. John the Baptist, Our Lady, and Isaiah to prepare us, convert us, to receive our Lord with a great love and a great desire to see his face in heaven, which joy I wish for all of you. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us with the course to thee. And for those who do not have recourse to thee, especially all communists and Freemasons and other enemies of Holy Mother Church, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.